let's take a look at sources of power. To exercise influence, a leader must have power, potential, or the ability to influence decisions and control resources. A recent analysis of power suggests that it consists of two broad types, the old and the new. Old power is held by few, and once it's acquired, it's jealously guarded. Powerful people have a substantial store of power which they can use as needed. Such power is inaccessible to most people, and it's leader-driven. New power is created by many, is open, participatory, and peer-driven. Sharing knowledge on social media is an example of this new power, and so are customers who provided input in the design of products they use. Power in organizations is mostly about old power, but processes such as empowerment and shared leadership tend towards being the new power. Organizational power can be derived by many sources. How people obtain power depends to a large extent on the type of power they seek. Therefore, to understand the mechanics of acquiring power, one must also understand what types of power exist and the sources and origins of these types of power. Seven types of power, including some of their subtypes, are described in following courses. Power is frequently classified according to whether it stems from the organization or the individual. Three bases of power, legitimate power, reward power, and coercive power stem from the person's position in the organization. The lawful right to make a decision and expect compliance is called legitimate power. People at the highest levels of the organization have more power than people below them. However, organizational culture helps establish the limits to anyone's power. Newly appointed executives, for example, are often frustrated with how long it takes to effect major change. At the top of the organization, a leader's legitimate power is strengthened when he or she serves as CEO and chairman or chairwoman. Executives who occupy a dual role show a unity of command and strong leadership to stakeholders. The authority to give employees rewards for compliance is reward power. If a vice president of operations can directly reward supervisors with cash bonuses for achieving productivity targets, this manager will exert considerable power. Almost any leader occupying a formal position has some reward power. Even the ability to give a subordinate a positive performance evaluation is a form of reward power. Coercive power is the power to punish for non-compliance. It's based on fear. A common coercive tactic is for an executive to demote a subordinate manager who does not comply with the executive's plans for change. Coercive power is limited in that punishment and fear achieve mixed results as motivators. The leader who relies heavily on coercive power runs the constant threat of being ousted from power themselves. Nevertheless, coercive power is widely practiced. At their worst, leaders who rely heavily on coercive power are considered to be power mongers in the sense that they will go to extremes to gain and retain power. Three sources of power stem from characteristics or behavior of the power actor, expert power, referent power, and prestige power. All are classified as personal power because they're derived from the person rather than the organization. Expert power and referent power contribute to charisma. Referent power is the ability to influence others through one's desirable traits and characteristics. Expert power is the ability to influence others through specialized knowledge, skills, or abilities. A component of expert power is having information not widely possessed by others, such as being an accurate predictor of commodity prices. Another important form of personal power is prestige power, the power stemming from a person's status or reputation. A manager who has accumulated important business successes acquires prestige power. Managers acquire visibility based on their reputation. For example, a middle manager who has been successful at reducing turnover in the restaurant or hotel industry. Integrity is another contributor to prestige power because it enhances the leader's reputation. Executive recruiters identify executives who can readily be placed in senior positions because of their excellent track records or prestige. 
Executive leaders accrue power in their capacity as agents acting on behalf of shareholders. The strength of ownership power depends on how closely the leader is linked to shareholders and board members. A leader's ownership power is also associated with how much money he or she has invested in the firm. An executive who is a major shareholder is much less likely to be fired by the board than one without any equity stake. The CEOs of high technology firms are typically company founders who later convert the firm into a publicly held company by selling stock. After the public offering, many of these CEOs own stock worth several hundred million dollars, making their position quite secure. The new golden rule applies. That is, quite simply, the person who holds the gold rules. According to the dependence perspective, people accrue power when others are dependent on them for things of value. Because of things valued could be physical resources or a personal relationship, dependence power can be positional or personal. Power resides implicitly in the other's dependence. A leader group member example would be that the group member who needs considerable recognition to survive becomes dependent on the leader who is a regular source of recognition. An organizational example is that of the healthcare system in the United States, which has become heavily dependent on information technology to help streamline the system. Should leaders lose some of their power to control resources, their power declines. Power can be derived from being in the right place at the right time and taking the appropriate action. It pays to be where the action is. For example, the best opportunities in a diversified company lie in one of its growth divisions. Also, many small recycling firms moved from junkyard status to ecology firms as the interest in environmental sustainability surged in the mid-2000s. A person or a firm also needs to have the right resources to capitalize on an opportunity, such as having the capacity to recycle on a larger scale. It therefore becomes more difficult for small recyclers to capitalize on the opportunity of the surge in demand for the recycled. The strategic contingency theory of power suggests that units best able to cope with a firm's critical problems and uncertainties acquire relatively large amounts of power. The theory implies, for example, that when an organization faces substantial lawsuits, the legal department will gain power and influence over organizational decisions. Furthermore, the leader of the legal department gains power themselves. The leaders of units directly involved with the organization's core purposes usually have more power than those leaders of departments not directly linked to the core purpose. The closer a person is to power, the greater the power he or she exerts. Likewise, the higher a unit reports in a firm's hierarchy, the more power it possesses. In practice, this means that a leader in charge of a department reporting to the CEO has more power than one in charge of a department reporting to a vice president. Leaders in search of more power typically maneuver towards a higher reporting position in the organization. An obvious problem about leadership power is that it can be directed more towards self-serving behavior than the good of others, including the organization and all stakeholders. A study conducted with working supervisors as well as a laboratory simulation investigated the influence of accountability on leader self-serving behavior. Accountability focused on the expectation that the leader may be called upon to justify his or her beliefs, feelings, and actions to others. Self-serving behavior in the study focused on the distribution of resources, such as the leader receiving a disproportional share of cash bonuses. A major finding of the study was that powerful leaders who were held accountable acted less self-servingly than their non-accountable counterpart. Another set of studies helps explain why some people who attain power act out of self-interest, whereas others with power act in the interest of others. The influential or moderating variable studied was moral identity the extent to which the individual holds morality as part of his or her self-concept. Trait power was measured both through a questionnaire about power and subjective power was measured from a studied participants describing simulations and situations in which they experienced power. 
The study concluded that individuals with a strong moral identity were less likely to act in self-interest when they had strong trait power or subjective feelings of experiencing power. In contrast, individuals with a weak moral identity were more likely to act in self-interest under trait power or feelings of power. If you are moral, you are less likely to use power for your own good. The person who then uses the accumulated power to create and implement a useful vision qualifies as an excellent leader. The concept of who is an excellent leader could be based on a person's values. A leader's power and influence increases when he or she shares power with others. Empowerment is therefore a basic component of shared or distributed leadership. In its basic meaning, empowerment refers to passing decision-making authority and responsibility from managers to group members. Almost any form of participative management, shared decision-making, and delegation can be regarded as empowerment. Work has meaning when there is a fit between the requirements of the work role and a person's beliefs, values, and behaviors. A person who is doing meaningful work is likely to feel empowered. Competence or self-efficacy is an individual's belief in his or her capability to perform a particular task well. People who feel confident believe that they have the capability to meet performance requirements in a given situation. Self-determination is an individual's sense of having a choice in initiating or regulating action. A high-level form of self-determination occurs when workers feel that they can choose the best method to solve a particular problem. Impact is the degree to which the worker can influence strategic, administrative, or operating outcomes on the job. Another dimension of true empowerment is for the group member to develop an internal commitment towards work goals. Internal commitment takes place when workers are committed to a particular project, person, or program for individual motives. A leader can empower team members simply by fostering greater initiative and responsibility in their work assignments. Empowered workers who have the responsibility to carry out activities that support the major goals of the organization will identify more with the company. For empowerment to be effective, employees should have ample information about everything that affects their work. Especially important is for workers to fully understand the impact of their actions on companies' costs and profit. Under ideal conditions, the leader explains to the individual or group what needs to be done and lets the people involved choose the method. Explaining why the tasks need to be performed is also important. Encouraging team members to lead themselves is the heart of empowerment. The basic idea of self-leadership is that all organizational members are capable of leading themselves at least to some extent. Although leaders empower group members, they should still provide guidance, emotional support, and recognition. All empowering practices can be influenced by cross-cultural factors. A group member's cultural values might lead to either an easy acceptance of empowerment or reluctance to be empowered. One situation in which empowerment creates dysfunction is when workers lack a clear boundary. Empowered group members may feel that they can now make decisions unilaterally without conferring with managers. Empowerment, as with many approaches to leadership, should be practiced from a contingency perspective. The leader should size up the situation and ask to what extent he or she should empower group members. A major contributor to empowerment is delegation, the assignment of formal authority and responsibility for accomplishing a specific task to another person. Without delegation, effective leadership and management cannot take place. Delegation becomes more important as more tasks need to be done and those tasks are complex. To lead is to inspire and persuade others to accomplish tasks, not to accomplish everything by working alone. Delegation is narrower than empowerment because it deals with a specific task, whereas empowerment covers a broad range of activities and a mental set about assuming more responsibility. Delegation, like empowerment, is motivational because it gives group members a chance. Instead of delegation being simply a method for the manager or leader to lighten the personal workload, it becomes a developmental opportunity for the recipient of a delegated task. 
When delegation is poor, conflict often erupts between the individual who thought he or she was responsible for a task and the delegator. A recommended way of making delegation effective is, is to specify how much accountability the person has for the assignment. Delegation often fails because the person assigned to the task does not know the amount of his or her responsibility. When the person assigned the task is an issue owner, the person has complete control under the task or decision. Under such conditions, delegation and empowerment are equivalent. As used here, the term organizational politics refers to informal approaches to gaining power through means other than merit or luck. Politics are played to achieve power either directly or indirectly. Power may be achieved in such diverse ways as by being promoted, by receiving a larger budget or other resources, by obtaining more resources for one's work group, or by being exempt from undesirable assignments. The meaning of organizational politics continues to shift in a positive, constructive direction. Politics are often used to advance the purposes of a leader's group, such as obtaining valuable resources. A team of scholars have proposed the concept of a leader's political support that points to the contribution of political behavior. Leaders need political skill for building alliances and gaining resources to their constituents. Nevertheless, many writers still regard organizational politics as emphasizing self-interest at the expense of others. People want power for many different reasons, including having more prestige and income, which is why political behavior is so widespread in organizations. By definition, politics is used to acquire power. The very shape of large organizations is the most fundamental reason why organizational members are motivated towards political behavior. Only so much power is therefore available to distribute among many people who would like more of it. Each successive layer on an organizational chart wields less power than the layer above. At the very bottom of the organizations, workers have limited power except for their legal rights. People often resort to organizational politics because they do not believe that the organization has an objective and fair way of judging their performance and suitability for promotion. Similarly, when managers have no objective way of differentiating effective people from less effective, they'll resort to favoritism. When people operate in an unstable and unpredictable environment, they tend to behave politically. Uncertainty makes it difficult to determine what they should really be accomplishing. Some people resort to political maneuvers to integrate themselves with supervisors because they lack confidence in their own talent and skill. Most organizational leaders say that they prefer honest feedback from subordinates. Yet without meaning to, these same managers and leaders encourage flattery and surlouve praise. Also, admirers are more likely to receive good assignments and high performance evaluation. To make effective use of organizational politics, leaders must be aware of specific political tactics and strategies. Ethical political behaviors can be divided into three related groups, tactics and strategies aimed at gaining power, building relationships with supervisors and coworkers, and avoiding political blunders. All of these political approaches help the leader gain or retain power and successfully manage stressful work environments. As defined by a group of researchers, political skill is a constructive force. Cultivating friendly, cooperative relationships with powerful organizational members and outsiders can make the leader's cause much easier to advance. Developing power contracts is focused type of social networking. A high level political strategy is to do whatever the political environment demands to attain your goals. Political correctness involves being careful not to offend or slight anyone and being extra civil and respectful. A natural inclination for most people is to resist change, so the person who steps forward first to accept reasonable changes will acquire some political capital. A useful tactic for developing a positive relationship with your manager is to ask about ways to improve your performance. Look for ways to make a stronger contribution to the group. 
A comprehensive strategy for both gaining power and building relationships is to develop positive psychological capital. Organizational politics involves building positive relationships with network members who can be helpful now or later, including subordinates, co-workers, external customers, and suppliers. Impression management includes behaviors directed at enhancing one's image by drawing attention to oneself. Often, the attention of others is directed towards superficial aspects of the self, such as clothing and grooming. Polite behavior provides an advantage. Courteous, pleasant, civil, and positive people are the first to be hired and the last to be fired. Asking advice on work-related topics builds relationships with other employees. Asking another person for advice, someone whose job does not require giving it, will usually be perceived as a compliment. One of the most basic political tactics is sending a thank you note. It's simply an application of sound human relations. Many successful people take the time to send handwritten notes to employees and customers to create a bond with people. A strategy for retaining power is to refrain from making power eroding blunders. Committing these politically insensitive acts can also prevent one from attaining power. The oldest saying in human relations is to praise in public and criticize in private. Yet the impassion of the moment, we may still surrender to an irresponsible impulse to criticize the boss publicly. Protocol is still highly valued in a hierarchical organization. Turning down top management, especially more than once, is a political blunder. You have to balance sensibly managing your time against the blunder of refusing a request from top management. To avoid hurting your career, it's important to avoid, or at least minimize, being blatantly tactless towards influential people. Any technique of gaining power can be devious if practiced in the extreme. A person who displays loyalty to a boss by feeding him or her insider information that could affect the price of company stock is being devious. Some approaches are unequivocally unethical. In the long run, they erode a leader's effectiveness by lowering credibility. Devious tactics might even result in lawsuits against the leader, organization, or both. An ancient strategy of embrace or demolish suggests that you remove from the premises rivals who suffered past hurts through your efforts. Otherwise, the wounded rivals might retaliate at a vulnerable moment. This kind of strategy is common after a hostile takeover. Many executives lose their jobs because they oppose the takeover. The objective of a setup is to place a person in a position where he or she will fail outright or look ineffective. Also referred to as turf wars, territorial games involve protecting and hoarding resources that give one power, such as information, relationships, and decision-making authority. An advanced, devious tactic for a manager is to pretend a catastrophe exists and then proceed to rescue others from the catastrophe, thereby appearing to be a superhero. The political player rushes in and declares that everything is a mess and the situation is almost hopeless. Shortly thereafter, he or she resolves the problem. Abusing power might be conceptualized as an unethical political tactic because the abuse often relates to behavior outside formal responsibility. Political abuse of power includes such acts as shouting and swearing at subordinates, sexually harassing them, and humiliating them in meetings. Organizational politics can hurt an organization and its members in wasted time, effort, and lower productivity. A group of researchers conducted a meta-analysis of available studies of the relationship between the perception of organizational politics and certain important outcomes. The perception of political behavior refers to the recognition that organizational politics are present. These are outcomes like more strain or adverse effects of stress, more intentions to quit or less job satisfaction, less emotional commitment to the employer, lower task performance, and less organizational citizenship behavior. 
When a high degree of political behavior is perceived to exist, it can damage individuals and the organization. To avoid these negative consequences, leaders should combat political behavior when it's excessive and dysfunctional. In a comprehensive strategy to control politics, organizational leaders must be aware of its causes and techniques. Open communication also can constrain the impact of political behavior. For instance, everyone should know the basis for allocating resources. When communication is open, it also makes it more difficult for some people to control information and pass along gossip as a political weapon. Avoiding favoritism, giving the best rewards to group members you like the best, is a potent way of minimizing politics within a group. Managers should reward workers who impress them through task-related activities. Setting good examples at the top of the organization can help reduce organizational politics. When leaders are non-political in their actions, they demonstrate in subtle ways that political behavior is not welcome. Another way of reducing the extent of political behavior is for individuals and the organization to share the same goals, a situation described as goal congruence. Politics can sometimes be constrained by a threat to discuss questionable information in a public forum. Hiring people with integrity will help reduce the number of dysfunctional political players. References should be checked carefully with respect to the candidate's integrity and honesty. Emphasize that success can mean a lateral move as well as a promotion. The purpose of managers at the company is to support people and remove barriers to getting things done. If managerial positions are not so important, fewer people will use political tactics to get a vertical promotion.